the conditions weren't right. It, not just the conditions in the air of how hot it was, but the conditions uh, politically in that time. It, 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 it wasn't right. Uh, the conditions <clears throat> socially, it wasn't right. It wasn't the right time. The conditions uh, culturally, it wasn't the right time. But somehow, some way, 11 dudes from a little town called Jerusalem in the surrounding area managed to take a message from one guy, one leader, who wasn't even physically present with them anymore and spread that message throughout the entire region. And then from that entire region, it, it grew and it grew and it grew until it was a worldwide phenomenon and still is to this day. That's right, the church. Back when it first started, when Jesus said, Peter, on, on this rock, not on Peter, on this rock, on who Jesus was, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. From that moment on, when Jesus started building his church, he was correct. The gates of hell could not prevail. Now, there was political unrest. There was cultural unrest. There was, it was hot in the desert. Uh, there, was, there was social unrest. There was uh, people trying to kill Christians. One of them actually became a Christian, Paul, who was writing the letter to the Galatians. And, uh, and people were trying to kill him. They were getting outnumbered. They were getting outranked. They were getting outflanked by uh, all these different different cultures and politically Rome was about to invade a lot of things were going against them but still somehow the church managed to grow and explode and make an impact the world like this has never seen and my life verse is acts 4:13 and it says now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men they were astonished and here's the key. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. That's why I love that verse. I am an unschooled common man, but man, I hope that people recognize that I have been with Jesus. And, and guys, they started using, the reason that this church exploded, the reason that they did what they were able to do is because they used their newfound freedom in a way that we don't today. And Paul is talking to that in, in Galatians chapter 5. We're only going to be covering three verses today. So if you've got a Bible, open it up to Galatians 5. Uh, we're going to start in verse 13, and we're going to get right after it. We're going to look at freedom today, and how do we use our freedom? It doesn't make sense. The church has so much uh, opportunity to grow and to build and to be something amazing. And in a lot of ways, it is. There are churches that are doing amazing things, people that are doing amazing things, but not everywhere. And so we're going to get into that today. Guys, I hope you are ready for this. Uh, Galatians 5, we're doing, like I said, three verses today. So dive in. I'm going to read all three verses, and then we're just going to cover it like crazy. Okay? All right. So Galatians 5, starting in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, Notice he's saying brothers again. He, he, this, is, this is a personal, uh, this is intimate. These are the, the people who are following Jesus. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Interesting, he's bringing up serving and slavery, basically, which is what that word means. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Guys, that's our whole point today. That, that, I mean, th those are the three verses. Uh, I actually was supposed to cover these three verses last week, and I completely forgot. When I was doing my notes, when I was reading three things, I looked at the wrong list and saw that I was only supposed to go to verse 12, and so that's all I did. So we're extending uh, Galatians, the Jesus and series, by one week because I didn't do that. But I'm so glad that I have 40 minutes to devote to these three verses. We're talking about freedom. Now, the first question I have is, do people see Christians as free? 
There was a time when these 11 dudes uh, exploded the church and, and they were seen as free. They were using their freedom to serve one another. Now they understood freedom like you and I don't because they were set free from a, a way of law, a way of legalism that we, honestly, we haven't felt that level. For the most part, we haven't. Now, some of us probably have, but for the most part, we haven't. They were strict in what they were supposed to do. So they had been set free and they were not turning back. And we can say, well, yeah, but they they saw, I mean, they were with Jesus. We have the scripture. They had no Bible. They had no referencing one whatsoever. All they had was the Old Testament. The Torah, the, the books of the law and the prophets and, and the Psalms uh, is basically what it was called. Psalms just meant the rest of the, the, the Bible, Old Testament. That's all that they had. And they had firsthand accounts of what was happening, uh, what had happened to Jesus and what was going on. And they proclaimed his name and what they'd done in his life. They were unschooled men. They didn't know anything any better. They were just preaching the word. That's all that they were doing. And they were meeting needs. So today, do people see Christians as free or something else? What is the perception of Christians these days? Is it good? I mean, I can answer that for you right now. The majority is most people don't, that aren't Christians probably don't really like Christians that much, at least here in the United States. So what are we doing wrong? Where is the freedom at? And why are we not using it? What are we doing wrong with our freedom that the early church wasn't? Now, the early church, we can romanticize this. I've talked about that before. This is not a romantic thing for the early church. There was a lot of strife. There was a lot of struggle. They had the legalizers coming in. There were church splits. There were things going on. Um, There were issues within the church. So we can't see this. And if you look in the book of Acts with rose-colored glasses and be like, wow, everything was so perfect. I wish we could just go back to that. They did a lot of things wrong, and also a lot of them were getting murdered. So there's that. So we can look back at the early church and and see the things that they did right, but also understand they did a lot of things wrong too, just like today. Okay, but they were good with the freedom thing. So we're going to talk more and more about that. Uh, And so how are we using our freedom? In, in, in Christian circles today, how are we using our freedom? More often than not, we're using our freedom to sin. Now, now, what Paul is saying, this is freedom from sin. We have been freed from sin. We talked about this a little bit last week. We don't use it just so that we can continue sinning. We are free from sin. We are not free to sin. There's a difference. He says uh, not to use it as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. There's a thing called uh, worldly freedom. That when he says that word opportunity, what he's talking about, it's a, it's a military term to gain a stronghold onto a beachhead, like to, to get that foothold. Like um, when, when um, U.S. And, and whoever forces, I don't know history that well, uh, when they stormed the beaches of Normandy in, in World War II, they now had an opportunity, they had a foothold on that beach and they were able to continually attacking from there. So what Paul is saying is don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh to gain a foothold. Don't go into the struggles. Don't go into the things that you uh, have dealt with before. Um, We're all a slave to something. We just get to choose what that is. And a lot of us are choosing the wrong thing when it comes to to our freedoms. We're we're choosing to become slaves to something, one thing or another. We talked about this a little bit last week about uh, even the issue of alcohol. We are free to drink alcohol unless it enslaves you then you shouldn't. If it ever was something that I had an issue with, I wouldn't drink alcohol anymore because I would be enslaved to it. But thankfully, to the glory of God, I don't, and so I can enjoy it. Here's the thing about worldly freedom. Worldly freedom will always lead to a moral dilemma. It it, it, it leads to the exploitation of others, And it leads to a do-your-own-thing type of society. Does that sound a little bit familiar right now? A do-your-own-thing. Hey, man, whatever you want to believe is good for you. You use your freedom the way you want to use your freedom. I'll use my freedom the way that I want to use freedom. Let's just all just be hippies and and love one another and just, you know, smoke a few joints, have a few drinks, love who you want to have sex with, whoever you want to have sex with. Like, just, man, we're free. We can do whatever we want. But it's always going to lead to some sort of moral dilemma. Where's the line? At what point do we, do we put, a, put a stop to things? 
It's going to come up with, because if you're free to do whatever you want, then how can I tell you not to do something? Because it infringes on my freedom? Well, whose freedom are we going to actually be talking about then? Your freedom or my freedom? Because my freedom says that I can do dot, 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 while your freedom says that I can't. So we're at a crossroads. There's a moral dilemma there. And it's always going to lead to the exploitation of others. Because we're not going to be able to... We're not, we, innately, we don't want to serve one another. We want to serve ourselves. And if we follow our own selfish desires, our worldly freedoms, uh, whatever it is that we want, it's going to come at the expense of someone else. Because the exploitation of, exploitation of others, we think of the most derogatory things, the most awful things when we hear that word exploitation, but it can be a simple thing like, I'm going to lie to you about something because I, I care more about my freedoms. I'm going to lie to you about how I feel, what I did, all of those things, because it makes me feel better, and I don't value the way that you feel. And so I can just keep lying. I can keep doing the things that I do. I can exploit your weaknesses so that I can gain ground. I mean, it's, it's, it's the way some, some uh, look at gas companies, right? Oftentimes, when there is a shortage on gas, you bump up the price because, well, or if there's a high demand for gas, you bump up the price on gas, that's exploiting so, <coughs> excuse me, somebody else, because they feel that they have the freedom to do that, and they do. It's the exploitation of others. And, and then all of us are like, hey, we don't like how you're raising the price of gas. We don't like how you're doing this. We don't like how you're exploiting us with your, your high prices. Traverse City Tourism, one-on-one. We can go downtown. We can have a burger. It's going to cost us 20 bucks. We can go outside of town, have a burger. It'll be 12 bucks, right? They're exploiting tourism. And we can say, hey, we don't like that. And they can say, I don't care. That's my freedom. Do you see how this is now an issue where if we're just free to do whatever it is we want, man, we're never going to get anywhere. Worldly freedom always leads to moral dilemmas, exploiting of others, and do your own thing type of society. But that only works so far because somebody has to have an opinion. Somebody's opinion is going to win out and somebody else's freedom is going to lose out. And that leads us to verse 15. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. He's basically saying you're acting like beasts if you're using for freedom just for your own selfish pleasures. It's like you'll, you'll bite each other, you'll devour one another. And he's speaking to the church. Man, we sure do have a, that on, on lockdown, don't we? Of, of, of biting one another and fighting and infighting and all this crazy stuff going on within the church because, you know, my freedom is my freedom, your freedom is your freedom, and you don't like my freedom, and, and, and I don't like your freedom, and so we're just going to fight each other, and we're going to devour one another. <laughs> so we're busy fighting each other. We're, we're having a civil war, basically, while the rest of the world is just looking at us and like, do you want to jump into that? I don't want to jump into that. Do you want to jump into that? No, thanks. And we wonder why the church is failing. And we wonder why uh, numbers are, 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 are declining. And we wonder why people don't come back after COVID. <laughs> because we haven't set a place that's good for anyone to show up. We're more concerned about our own personal freedoms than, than serving one another. And honestly, sometimes, and this is part of the reason why the church is afraid of freedom, because it means a lack of control, right? Oh man, if the church says you're free to do whatever you want, you're free, like you are free under Christ, uh, and, 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 and we have no say over that, right? Well, maybe, but n actually, no, not at all. The church does have, still have some control. I know the church loves control, uh, but we do have control over one another, over other Christians, because we do have a responsibility to judge others. And I know immediately you're going to say like, no, Brian, because uh, remember, uh, it's <laughs> the Bible. Jesus said it in Matthew 7, judge not lest ye be judged. I, I grew up Baptist, so I have the, the King James Version fresh in my mind. Judge not lest ye be judged. Okay, right. Yeah, judge not lest ye be judged. That's, that's true. Never mind. We shouldn't judge each other. Or let's figure out the context of what Jesus was talking about in that Sermon on the Mount. We covered that uh, in our first year together. Uh, we had a sermon series called uh, Message, uh, Mountain of a Message from a Mountain. That's what it was. I should have shorter sermon series so like Jesus. Um, that way I could remember them. Anyway, Matthew 7 
Jesus actually says, judge not lest you be judged. Yes, he did say that in verse one. But he goes on to say, because you're gonna be measured, judged against the same judgment that you're making. That You'll be measured against the same measure that you give out. So basically, how do you want to be judged? And that's how we should judge one another. And then he goes on to say, the speck in, in your eye, or the speck in his eye and the log in your eye. And we try to say that too, right? Oh, you're just seeing the speck in my eye and not the log in yours. Uh, okay, here's also what Jesus says right after that. He says, take the log, take the plank out of your eye. Why? So that you can see more clearly the speck in your brother's eye and help him get it out. That's judgment. And we had a whole mini series on judgment not long ago because we covered this uh, in our Genesis series and we went into it uh, a, a lot deeper. If you want to go back and find that, feel free to do that. We do have a responsibility to judge one another. Uh, it says in John 7, chapter 24, Jesus says, don't judge by appearances, but with right judgment. Don't, don't just judge by the perception of what that person is doing. You can't judge the heart. Only God can judge the heart, but we can judge actions. And in Christian circles, with Christians, with brothers and sisters, we should judge actions inside the church. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, that we should judge inside the church. We should judge those. In, in 1 Corinthians 5, he's talking about somebody who is in sexual immorality. And he's saying, you guys, don't even eat with that person. Don't, don't, don't associate with that person. Because to eat with someone in that time meant that you identified with them. You were for them. You supported them. You did all that stuff with them. And so he's saying, if there's sexual immorality among you, don't, I don't, don't, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, don't encourage it. Don't, ah, you guys are probably saying it right on, on, the, on the camera, on the other side of the camera, right? Uh, don't enable, there it was. Don't enable someone to continue in that sin, but judge one another and say, listen, I know this is what's happening. I think, hear me out. I just care for you and I want you to be better. And I want you to live a different life. And I want you to be free in Christ, but you're using your freedom for something else. You're using your freedom to sin instead of serving one another. And it sounds harsh, but it's, uh, when we judge, it's, it's, we're seeking to restore. There's a reason we called Restoration Church restoration because we want to see the restoration of souls to Jesus Christ. Not just those far from God, but also those who identify as Christians, those of us who call ourselves believers, followers of Christ. We want to seek to restore. See, we think of this idea of love as just being fold over, and let it be whatever it's going to be. I can't, I love you too much to, to say anything. So I just won't, I, because I love you, I'm just not going to say anything. I don't want to hurt your feelings. No, you love yourself. And you don't want to get into it. Free love is a slave to God and man. That's our whole point, this whole, this whole message. Free love is a slave to God and man. Here's the idea, all right? A river can run freely because there's banks on either side. There's boundaries. And, and we don't like to think about that too much, but, but a river is a river because of the banks that, that make it a river, right? If there were no banks on the river, it would just flow out. It would just be this gross, mucky pond thing. Have you ever just walked on still water, like not a lake, but just like a, a, a swamp? It's gross. There's one right across the street from my house and it's, I, I don't, you know what I don't do? I don't walk on it. Why? Because it's gross. If it was a river, if it had some, some banks to it, I might go in that river, unless it's a really dirty river, like, like in Chicago or something, probably not going to go in it. But the reason that river can flow so freely is because there's boundaries to it. And that's what we need to understand, church, is there are boundaries for the way that we live our lives. And one of them is that free love is a slave to God and man. Like I said, we're all a slave to something. We just get to choose what? And I want us to choose, be a slave to God and to man. That's what he's talking about. That's what uh, Paul is referencing when he says, um, 
that uh, not to use it as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. When he's saying serve, that word serve actually means slave, be enslaved to one another. You're like, well, that doesn't sound like freedom to me. It sounds like slavery. <laughs> And then if I've learned anything, slavery is bad. But this is voluntary slavery. Like I said, we're all a slave to something. We just get to choose what it is. And oftentimes we're choosing the wrong thing. We're a slave to ourselves. We're a slave to our addictions. We're a slave to whatever it is. For instance, and I know this might touch close to home for some people. Sorry, not sorry, all right? Because I care more about us living a Christian life, living after what God would have us do, than using it for our own worldly freedom. A lot of us use money as our God. We're a slave to money. And the decisions we make are based on financial decisions. Yeah, we just couldn't find a place. I, I couldn't find a place to rent and, and, and rent is so expensive that, uh, you know, we're just going to live together, she and I. I, I, I we're not married. Um, we're going to share a bed. We're going to share our lives. We're going to have sex all the time. But uh, we're doing it for a financial reason. It's a, it's a financial reason that we're, we're doing this. If you're living together because it makes financial sense, you know what that is? That means that money is your God. You're a slave to money. Because if God is your God, then you don't live together. You don't have sex with each other outside of marriage. That's just, I, I know I'm probably hitting close to home for somebody and you might turn it off. I don't care because here's the deal. I love you and I want what's best for this church. And, and the church is us. And it seems like it's just something we're letting slide through. oh, it's not that big of a deal anymore. Everybody's doing it. And have you seen the economy? We just have to do it. I, I, it's weird. I just don't see that anywhere in the Bible where God was like, uh, n no sex outside of marriage. You know, unless, unless you just can't make it work financially and you need to move in together. Uh, that, you know, that's fine. Where is that okay? See, we're serving ourselves instead of God. And it might make things tight. And oh, oh, you couldn't find anyone to move in with? You, can, you don't have a few buddies that you could just rent a place with? Come on, get creative. Now there is a, 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 a thing of, of, we've talked about this before, personal conviction versus biblical truth. We can judge biblical truth, but we can't necessarily judge personal conviction, all right? Because what my conviction is necessarily isn't your conviction, except for that last one, that's a biblical conviction, okay? But personal convictions, you know, like alcohol, like uh, what movies you go see, um, some, some movies, um, what, uh, what you do in your spare time, how often you go to church, all of that kind of stuff, those are personal convictions. How often you serve, personal convictions, not necessarily biblical convictions, okay? And Paul warns us against personal convictions versus biblical convictions in Romans 14 in his letter to the Rome church, church in Rome. Uh, I said that weird. I want to read that scripture for us and then we'll come back to, to what it means to, be a, to, 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 to serve one another, to be a slave. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. That never happens, right? I mean, we don't quarrel over opinions. Churches haven't split over small opinions, right? Like, that's never happened, so I don't even know why Paul wrote that. Uh, one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. You hear that, vegetarians? Let not, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Who are you to pass judgment on personal convictions? That's what that means. Again, it doesn't mean we don't judge one another, but we can't judge personal convictions. I've got a friend who doesn't drink alcohol because they just abstain from it, okay? They don't like alcohol. They don't think that it's good. So for them, it's sin if they drink alcohol. I've got another friend who doesn't swear. No, no bad language whatsoever. No, no swear words at all. Uh, 
And that's a personal conviction. He's not going to hold every single person to that. Uh, and he's a, he's a, a pastor at a church. If anybody on his staff swears, though, he's like, come on, guys, we can do better than that. Because that's the personal conviction. And if you're on that staff, that's what you adhere to. I've been on other staffs where that's not the case. Uh, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Well, I take Fridays off. Some people take Saturdays off. Some people take Monday, Sundays off. Some people don't take any days off. You should probably take a day off. The one who observes, observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. See, it's a matter of heart. It's a matter of posture to God. Am I doing this because I love God or because I love what? Like I said, we're all a slave to something. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Christ died and lives again so that we can have death in our sin, death in our lives, and a physical death and still have life. What Paul is saying here in, in Romans, what Paul is saying in Galatians is to serve one another. Be a slave to, be devoted to, obey. And if the church, guys, if you and I would really start to understand this, I think we would start to see miracles happening. And I'm gonna expand on that in a minute. We would start to see the church growing in ways we never thought possible before. We would start to see a culture change like never before. I, I laughed uh, a few months ago. I was driving through town and there was a sign that said, uh, revival coming this week, like whatever that week it was. Like they're scheduling out revivals. Like they can plan, okay, this is when the revival is going to happen. The revival doesn't happen on a Sunday morning. Uh, that's part of it, absolutely. With just preaching, teaching, and, and some worship, that can be a part of it, but that's not the bulk of a revival. A revival happens in the hearts of me and in the hearts of you, and then it spreads to the hearts of others by what by by what by the way that we serve and love God and one another that's reflected in our life we start doing things instead of just listening to messages and being like oh yeah I should do better I should be better and then we don't do anything else if our Christian life is summed up on Sunday morning for an hour and a half then we're not living the Christian life we're, we're just not because it's what happens Sunday afternoon once you get home from church all the way until the next Sunday morning when you show up to church. What's happening in that? That's where revival is going to happen. That's where the church explodes. That's where you start to see your life change by the way that we serve one another. I, I can guarantee that if we would take this practice and we would actually apply it to our daily lives, it would fix marriages. I, I guarantee it. Husbands, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to get into it here, okay? Husbands, perk up. Listen up. Stop watching SportsCenter. Stop, stop checking the news feed. Stop checking to see what's happening in Russia. Stop checking to see what the president's up to now. And listen, right here. You got me? Are you with me? Listen, you are not owed a thing. She doesn't have to make you dinner. She doesn't have to do the dishes. She doesn't have to look after your kids. You are owed nothing. You serve your wife as Christ served the church. That's why I put that in every single marriage, uh, marriage ceremony that we do. Serve your wife as Christ served the church. That's biblical. So that means you don't have to win the argument. That means when you get home from work, and if your wife is a stay-at-home wife, and she's that, that's the, how you've decided to live, and she hasn't made dinner yet, and the house isn't clean yet, that doesn't mean you start arguing with her that the dishes aren't done and that the house isn't clean. It's that you start picking up the dishes. You start doing the dishes. You start doing the chores. You take the kids out because you have no idea what your wife dealt with that week or that day. 
serve your wife like Christ served the church and watch what happens to your marriage. Now, wives, on the flip side, men need a lot of forgiveness. And I'm not giving men a pass at all, but men need forgiveness. Husbands need a lot of forgiveness. If you won't forgive him for something he's done in the past, then why are you still with him? If you're holding on to a grudge, and this goes both ways, I guess, but if you're holding on to a grudge and you won't let something pass, maybe it's a past infidelity, maybe it's a past um, addiction issue, maybe it's something that's still going on to this day, but if we cannot learn to forgive one another and serve one another and love one another, then the marriage isn't going to last, so you might as well just drop out now. And, I, and, I, and I'm not condoning divorce. I'm not saying you should go get divorce. But if you're going to live in a place where you're not allowing yourself to forgive one another and serve one another, then what are you doing? Free love is a slave to God and man. It also means that it creates marriages. Okay, guys, I'm going to go to you again. Are you serving the woman you're living with but not married to? By not marrying her. Who are you serving? Again, is it a financial reason? Oh, there's just too much money that's owed still. We just can't do it. We can't afford to get married. Really? I don't charge to marry people. I'll be honest with you. You want to get married? I will marry you. I think it's ridiculous sometimes that people would charge, uh, a pastor would charge. I'm not, this is a personal conviction, not a biblical conviction, all right? But if you want to get married, I will marry you free of charge. I've got a spot to do it too. Let's just make it happen. If she's good enough to sleep with, she's good enough to marry. So who are you serving? Yourself, your own needs, your own satisfaction. Well, she's having sex with me, so why do I need to get married? Living this way, serving one another, can heal divorced people, heal those relationships. You probably won't get remarried, but there can be uh, trust. There can be love again between the two of you. Not that you have to be remarried, although that would be great, but that's not, I know that's not always possible. But if we just try to serve one another, if there's kids involved, how can I best serve my children and, and, and my ex? Do you see how, how this changes the way that we live our lives? Do you see how this looks so countercultural to what we're doing today? Do you see how Christians today look just like the rest of the world? I was challenged by a pastor friend this week. Um, we were talking about some different leaders and stuff, and, and uh, he said, um, if, if you can't, show your congregation what's happened in the last three weeks and let them decide, should this person still be a leader? Should I still be your pastor? If I showed you what happened in my life the last three weeks, would I be able to show that to the congregation and the congregation vote, yeah, we think Brian can still be the pastor? Or did I offend people? Did I do something wrong with my wife? Did I do something to my wife? Did I uh, rage against my kids? Did 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 anything in me happen that was like, ah, man, that wasn't good? And that's the measure. Well, that's a pretty high standard. <laughs> yeah. It is. But remember what we talked about last week. That's where grace falls in. And guys, I'm, I'm being graceful in, in calling out the sin that's right now in the church that I see for Restoration Church. Yeah, I know. It doesn't mean we have to be a slave to law. There's a difference between being a slave to law and a slave to love. See, law was a fear of punishment, and what Paul is saying is, is you get to be a slave to, to people, not to law. And, and, the, and the motivation is the reason why. Law is about fear of punishment. Love is a motive under grace. 
It's because what Jesus did for me that I'm going to love you and do the thing and serve you the way that the best that I, that He can. <laughs> Here's the deal, and this is how it's it's going to work out in my life. Uh, I, I've I've made jokes often that I don't. Um, I don't do well one-on-one, -on -one, the counseling thing. Like, I'd much rather just be on stage, and that's true. But here's the other thing, is, is I do love you and the church. And I love Jesus. And I love Jesus more than you. <laughs> and I'm hoping that the Jesus in me is going to help me love you more. And so I'm willing to, to, to do counseling with you guys. I'm willing to meet with you guys because of the love of Jesus in me. It's not Brian's love. Brian's love is like, nope, I don't care. I don't want to be a part of this. But Jesus' love through me, that's going to cause me to serve you more and, and get beyond the awkwardness. And it doesn't... There's so many people that we can serve. It's not just the people that look like us and think like us and feel like us, but it's, it's, it's across the board. It's political, uh, other side of the politic divide. It's the person that divorced you. It's the person that cheated on you. It's your kids who you're estranged from. What does love look like? What does serving look like? Now, I understand sometimes you have to do this, and you have, serving them is letting them go. Like in, in 1 Corinthians 5, he said, you know what? For that person, cast them out. That's showing grace. That's showing love. Let them do whatever it is that they're going to do. That's showing love, and that's showing grace. And those are extenuating circumstances, and I get it. I understand it. I've been around it. But I look at all the different people that Jesus served, and I see how we can be different. Matthew 20, 28 says that uh, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. That's what Jesus said. And if we're going to be people following Jesus, what does that mean? That we are going to be serving, not to be served. We're going to use our freedom to serve one another. And because we have that grace, we can climb that rock wall like we talked about last week, right? We can climb that knowing that we might fall down, knowing that uh, it, it's going to happen, but we're going to have the security of his grace. So we can take these risks and serve. And I just want to take a few moments as we close here just to look at all the different types of people that Jesus served and what his mindset was when he went to serve them. Matthew 8, 16 says, That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. So there's a man who was demon-possessed, mental issues, all of that kind of stuff. And he came and he cast out the spirits and he healed people who were sick in the evening time. In the evening, it wasn't during work hours. It was in the evening time. Matthew 14, 14 says, When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And then he went on to feed the 5,000. This was right after John the Baptist was beheaded. He was grieving that. He went alone on a mountain to pray. He needed some time. He needed to decompress, but everybody followed after him. So he was tired. He was weary. He was weak. And yet he still performed miracles. He still served people. And then he fed 5,000 people with, with just a few loaves of bread and fish. So even when we're tired, is God calling you to do something? How do we serve one another even when we're tired? Now, when Jesus, uh, Matthew 19, now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Again, went with more healing. Uh, John, um, uh, John 4 tells about uh, the woman at the well who was... Um, had been married five times and the person she's with now isn't her husband. So she's living with a dude and she goes out in the middle of the day to draw water because she's uh, the black sheep of the community. The Samaritan woman comes up and Jesus, who is a Jewish person, uh, confronts her, confronts her and, and, and says, can I have a drink of water? And she's like, who are you, a Jew, asking a Samaritan woman? Samaritans hated Jews and vice versa, Jews had, because they couldn't agree on who was, who was right. 
Does that sound familiar? See, back a long time ago in, in, um, in the Old Testament, we're actually going to be covering this in, in a few weeks. Uh, we're going to be going through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. I'm really excited about it. But in that, uh, the whole background of that is Jewish people were uh, held captive by Babylon, Babylon and um, they were there for a while. Then they were allowed to go back to Jerusalem uh, to go back, not Jerusalem, just to go back and start rebuilding. And they went back to rebuild, but a lot of the Samaritans were still there. They were intermarrying. They were doing all this kind of stuff. And then they started to argue about who actually had the land. There was a lot of stuff going on. And so for a long time, hundreds of years, there's been a lot of background on the Samaritans and the Jewish people, and they don't like one another. And Jesus says, uh, it's not going to matter where you're from. Uh, the true worshipers will wor worship me in spirit and in truth. And he starts calling out the sin of the woman in a loving way. And she turns her life around and follows Jesus. And then the whole town starts following Jesus because of that one interaction with a woman who he probably shouldn't have been talking to as a Jewish person. So who is the person in your life that you shouldn't be talking to because of whatever your background is, whoever you are? Who are those people that you can serve that are different from you, have different views, different cultural views, different political views, different social views, different stances? <laughs> And how do we serve them so that, not to continue in sin, but so that we can turn people to Jesus? John chapter 14, Jesus kneels down, becomes a servant to his disciples, and he washes their feet, the crap covered feet of the disciples. We've covered that before when they were walking through the city. It was full time. It was Passover time. So there, the city was completely filled with people. As you walk down the streets, you're stepping in horse poop. You're stepping in donkey poop and, and camel poop, all the kinds of poop and human feces as well, all mixed in together. So when you would go into a house, there was always somebody there to wash your feet. But because they went in under the cover of darkness to have this last meal, because everybody was trying to kill them, there was no one there to wash their feet. And they decided that they thought they worried more about who were, where they were going to sit at the table, where they were going to be in Jesus' kingdom, instead of washing people's feet. And the ironic thing is, if one of them would have washed all of their feet, they would have been first in the kingdom. But Jesus took out of his out a robe and he put on a servant's cloth and brought the basin in and he started washing the disciples' feet one by one. Peter says, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And Peter's like, wash all of me then. And Jesus is like, stop, you don't need a bath. I just need to wash your feet. Calm down. Jesus washed Judas' feet. Free love is a slave to God and man. Now we're not using our freedom that way. Later on, after that evening meal, they were walking through the garden. Jesus prays, and as he comes back down, he had just been sweating blood. He is so concerned about what's about to happen. He says, Lord, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. So many times when we serve one another, we have to say, God, not my will, but your will be done. As they're walking along, Judas comes with Roman soldiers. To take Jesus away, Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. The Romans guard come to take him, and Peter, being Peter, draws a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the Roman soldiers. I forget his name. It's in the Bible. Look it up. Luke chapter 22. It says that Jesus stops everything. He rebukes Peter, says, put your sword away. And Jesus serves the one who's taking him to the cross picks up his ear, a little magic trick. I don't know if he actually picks up his ear, does a magic trick on his head, and the ear is there again. 
even as he's being brought to his death, he's still serving one another. Jesus was the most free person to ever walk this earth. Fully God, fully man. He could do whatever he want, whenever he wanted. He could kill anyone <laughs> whenever he wanted to. He can heal anyone whenever he wanted to. And he used his freedom not to be served, but to serve. And if the most free, most perfect person to have ever walked the earth served in that way, then what's my excuse? To use my freedom for worldly pleasures instead of serving one another. Finally, Jesus went to the cross and he used his freedom to serve all of humanity, you and me. So what's our response to that? Live in boyfriend, girlfriend, sleep with whoever you want because you're free. Keep living a really, really busy lifestyle because you can't slow down because too many people count on you. Not be willing to say the hard things because you want people to like you. Free love is a slave to God and man, and I pray that we can be that church and see our church explode, not because of a message, not because of the worship, but all together, we're serving Traverse City and the communities around us. Can we do that, Restoration Church? If this is your first time and you're hearing the gospel for the first time, we invite you into this beautiful relationship between Jesus and you. All you have to do is say a quick prayer. Say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I give you my life. Everything I have, I want to give over to you. I trust you. I want to put to death everything that was. I've been living for myself, and now I want to live for you. You say that prayer, you're a part of the family of God, and we start building his church through the way that we love one another. I expect to be accepting some requests for counseling and to get some people married. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. God, I pray that we would have boldness and courage to do the right thing, that we would stop living for ourselves and start living for you, God. And the implication of that is severe, but in such a good way, in a glorious way. I pray, Lord, that your kingdom come and live in our hearts and our kingdom diminish. That's in your precious name, the name of Jesus, amen.